The book of Numbers was written by Moses sometime between 1440 and 1400 BC and chronicles the Israelites wandering in the desert. After giving the Israelites the law at Mount Sinai, God leads the people through the wilderness to the outskirts of the Promised Land, the land God promised to Abraham back in Genesis. On the edge of Canaan, Moses sends 12 spies to scout out the land. After seeing how strong the Canaanites are, most of the spies oppose God's plan and advise Moses that they'd be better off as slaves in Egypt. Because of their opposition, God punishes the Israelites by restricting any of the current generation to enter the Promised Land. Apart from two spies, Joshua and Caleb, this generation is subject to wander, never to step foot in Canaan. The people complain, wishing they died back in captivity. As judgment, God sends serpents into the Israelite camp. True to his character, however, God also provides a means for their physical healing through Moses' obedience. In their wandering, God continues to protect, preserve, and provide for the Israelites, reminding us of God's sovereign justice and love. When the nearby Moabite king asks a sorcerer named Balaam to speak curses over the Israelites, his prayers to curse them can only be uttered as blessings. Balaam even prophesies the coming of a victorious king out of Israel. Again and again, God takes what was meant for evil and uses it for his good. So imagine being promised this promised land, something amazing like this with the land flowing with milk and honey, right? Everything you could ever want is there for the taking. And then you get so close, you're right at the edge, you're about to go in there and you get afraid. And you say, there's no way we can do this. There's no way we can accomplish that. Not only that, you get so frustrated with your circumstances that you start to say things like, we would have rather died in Egypt. We would rather be slaves back in Egypt. It doesn't really make sense when we're reading the story. It just, why would they do that? Why would they be so close and then, given to fear. Because in Leviticus, we read this this last week in our daily reading plan. It says this in uh, 26, 9 through 13. It says, I will look on you with favor and make you fruitful and increase your numbers, and I will keep my covenant with you. I'm giving you a promise. You will still be eating last year's harvest when you will have to move it out to make room for the new. I'm going to give you more than you need. I will put my dwelling place among you and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God and you will be my people. I'll be here for you. I am the Lord you God, who, your God who brought you out of Egypt so that you would no longer be slaves to the Egyptians. I broke the bars of your yoke and enabled you to walk with heads held high. So he's saying, I'm gonna fulfill all my promises. I actually defeated Egypt. I got you set free. I will uh, accomplish my promise. And yet Israel is saying, let's go back to captivity. Let's go back to Egypt. This, this back and forth, it essentially summarizes most of numbers, where they're constantly given an opportunity and then they say no. And they lose faith. They give in to fear. But to put it into greater perspective, I want to read to you out of the commentary for the book of Numbers. As I read this, the way it was described was very eye-opening to me, and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to rewrite it in any way that made any more sense. So I'm just going to read it right out of here. But it's a really cool perspective that I want you to listen to. This is from Roy Gain from the NIV Application Commentary. It says, on reading numbers, Florence Latower says, after a wedding, there's a marriage. That's obvious, but it's also profound. After the romance and celebration of a new permanently binding relationship with its vows of mutual fidelity, there's the rest of life. After forsaking all others, until death do us part, for better or for worse, to have and to hold in sickness and in health, we find out what these words mean through the joys, sorrows, mistakes, and success of faulty human beings living together in an imperfect and sometimes brutally challenging world. So it was with Israel and God. After the wedding at Sinai, where God proclaimed the covenant vows, the Ten Commandments, with awesome splendor, Israel essentially said, I do. And they built a house, a sanctuary together. There was a journey through the wilderness of real life. Whatever happened, they were in it together. The vows he had given were not only for Israel to keep, 
they were his vows too. We talked about that a couple weeks ago with Chris and the vows that were made. When he had said, you shall have no other gods before me, the equivalent of forsaking all others, he not only forbade polytheism, but he also pledged himself to be Israel's God. What happened after that was profoundly disturbing. While the divine groom lavished care on his bride, bringing her breakfast in bed through manna, protecting her from danger of the poisonous snakes in the Sinai Peninsula, and literally hovering over her in the Shekinah cloud, she grumbled.
See, we, we know the story of David that comes. This kid who is so weak that he can't even hold up Saul's armor when they tell him, when David says, I'm gonna go fight Goliath. He can't even hold that up. It's too big, it's too bulky. And he goes out there with a stone and he defeats a nine foot nine guy with a stone and a sling. I mean, to put that in perspective, that's, that's crazy. Think about that in your own mind. It, it just seems improbable, impossible, and yet he trusts in God's power. And so it becomes possible and God shows his glory and his power and all of Israel realizes God is good. See, the only hope we can rely on is the hope of Christ Jesus. As soon as our hope goes back on ourselves or someone else, we just return to the lies of the manipulator. And that's what he's hoping for. His hope is that our hope will be distracted on something else and not on God. So unequal power, manipulation, hope. And the last one is another strange one, love. How can love be one of the reasons that people stay in an unhealthy relationship and go back? Well, love, as the psychologist says, is complicated. Relationships, they have good times and bad, and the good times can be a powerful glue. Love is the ultimate connection solidified by months or years of time spent and energy invested. It's absolutely possible to be in love without being safe. And in a society that tells us love is all you need, And love conquers all. It can be hard to walk away from a life you've built together, even one that's not safe or healthy. And this is a tough one. It really is because love is paramount in our society and even in the hearts of humanity. We just desire love. That's how God created us. He wanted us to love him. And so we have a desire to love. We write songs about love. We make movies about love. It's what we seek. If you watch the Hallmark Channel, it's sappy love story after one And I'll do it at Christmas because I love Christmas and I'm going to do it. But that's all it is. It's like this desire for love. So society will tell us, well, in order to find true love, it takes sacrifice. You have to deal with the bad so that you can get the good. We have to deal with the junk to feel gratified and to feel what we consider to be love. And the reality is you do. Love is hard. It's not easy. It's not going to be your honeymoon phase the whole time. I hate to break it to you, Elsie and Nick. But they're not even in here to defend themselves. That's awesome. The reality is, though, that love is hard, and you do have to make sacrifices. But the question is, is what kind of sacrifices are we talking about? I guess the better question would be, what is true love? Because Israel lost focus of God's love, they started to put their love in false idols and and immorality. Because God said, I'm going to give you this promised land, and they made a mistake. They weren't able to go in, and they blamed God. Well, he doesn't love us then, so let's find love somewhere else. And we see in Numbers 25, 1, it says, While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women. See, love to them had become about gratification. If, if God's not going to let us go into the promised land, if he's not going to fulfill what he said he was going to do, then I'll find gratification somewhere else. Man, does that sound familiar in our society. If I can't feel good about this, then I will go pursue it somewhere else. We find love through sexual encounters, instant gratification, placing relativism on truth to make ourselves feel better. Even though we know it's wrong because the Bible is right there, his word is ringing true in our ears, we're like, yeah, but did God really say? Uh Uh-oh. There's clue number one. But it feels good. But it makes me feel better. So yeah, love does take a sacrifice. And yes, it is hard. But the thing is, is that ultimate love, true love that was given to us was made complete in the sacrifice the one ultimate sacrifice. As we read in John 15, 13, it says, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And God did exactly that. He was looking at Israel and he was like, you guys just aren't getting it. I'm promising you everything. And all I'm asking you to do is to love me and you're not understanding. So I'm gonna give you one more thing here. We saw that in the video that Balaam prophesied of this coming glory that was to come. And God says, all right, there's no greater love than this. So 
In John 3, 16, we read, For God so loved the world that he gave everything. His one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If this is the only way that you're going to get how much I love you, I'm going to surrender everything I have, sacrifice everything I have, so that you will finally get it. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. He is lavishing so much love on us that he was willing to give everything in order for us to be called his children. Amen? And it's an amazing gift that we so often forget because we look back at our old life. And we say, man, that was pretty good. At least, and God's saying, no, come on, I have the most for you. We settle for fear and love. We settle for all these things in love. But in 1 John 4, 18, it says, there is no fear in love. But perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. And I think that's where Israel made their mistake in this last verse is that they chose to live in fear. Just like an unhealthy relationship, they took the mentality of a victim instead of a conqueror. And if we're called children of God, then we are a part of his tribe and he is the greatest conqueror of all. He can conquer our sin. He can conquer our enemies. So we don't need to live in that kind of fear. Israel didn't know at the time that God was planning something greater, that he was willing to sacrifice it all in a new covenant with his son in order to set them truly free. They had no clue. And so they were settling. But what about you here this morning? You know that God fulfilled that promise, that God came with a second covenant, with a new covenant, with his son, so that we can be set free. Are you settling? Are you saying, well, Christianity is just too hard, and at least I'm happy doing what I'm doing. At least I'm managing. Are you settling for at least... Because of the cross, we can defeat the manipulator. We can keep our eyes on the promises of God and have true hope and true love in our daily walk. We don't have to be pursuing these different things that we feel might be love, but really is gratification. We don't have to look for hope in someone else or even in ourselves because we have hope placed in God Almighty who has given us everything. There is a promised land out there for all of us. There is something waiting for you because God promised us in John 10, 10 that he has a life for you and has it to the full. So don't walk in that maybe God has something for me. He does. He has a promise for you. Put your hope in that. Know that God loves you that much that he gave you that promise, that he gave you his son. And we see it through all of scripture, through this thread of scripture, that it's always been about redemption and salvation, that he's always given us a way out. He wants us to live in freedom with him. You know, I was talking with our small group via video chat a couple weeks ago. And the question came up, why did God create us not just to love him immediately and just, just have us love him? Why did he make it so we have free will? Why, we, why do we have choice and I was like, man, that's a heavy question. That's a deep one. But I said, God, we were made in the image of God, were we not? We were told that in scripture. So God desires love. And he knows what true love is. So when he created us, he knew that he couldn't force love on us. He didn't want to have robots out there saying, yeah, I love God, and not really meaning anything. Just like in a marriage relationship, when maybe you're at odds and you say, I love you, really like you. You've got those moments where you're not really sure that that love is real or true. God is the same way where he's like, I want you to truly love me, not just say it, but to live it out. I desire true love. So I created you with free will, with the choice to say yes or no. And I can't imagine the pain that that caused him to create his creation. It's like Angela and I saying to Everett and Evie, we love you so much, we'll do anything for you, but you don't have to love us in return. We want you to, 
We hope you do. And it'll break our hearts if you don't. But it's up to you. And we lavish our love, we lavish our care, we lavish everything we can on them. Even in those moments where it's like, go to bed. We still love them in hopes that they'll love us in return. And it's one of the greatest things ever when I come home from work and my kids are running into my arms saying, love you, daddy, love you. The other day I was here at work and working a little later than usual and my daughter has just started kindergarten so her emotions have been all over the place. But I get a video phone call and I'm like, who's this? And I look down and it's Evie. She's just bawling. Daddy, I miss you. Daddy, I miss you. When are you coming home? I want you to come home. Man, did that break my heart. I was like, I'm coming home right now. As soon as I can get home, I'll be home. But I want you to think about the Father's love. When was the last time you came to God? You said, Daddy, I miss you. Daddy, I miss you. I know I've made the wrong choice. I know that I've done wrong. I've been manipulated. I, I put my hope in the wrong thing, and I want to love you. I want to know you on a deeper level. Daddy, I miss you. See, I think there's some of us here this morning that have settled, that have said, at least. At least I can find comfort in this person's arms. At, at least I, I can go through life easier. And God's saying, no, I have the most for you because I'm your daddy. I want you to succeed. I want you to have the most you could ever have. I, I have a promise for you. And it's overflowing. Don't, don't settle. So as we head into prayer and one last song this morning, I want you to keep your mind on the fact that you are a child of God when you say yes to him and that he looks at you the same way, even more so that I look at my own kids. It's a kind of love that I'll never understand. But he's looking at you saying, please understand that I'll do anything for you. Will you just love me? you just say, Daddy, I miss you. I need you. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that we can call you Father, that you are good. God, that we're no longer slaves to fear, that we don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to be like the Israelites who desire to go back to that kind of life because you promise that those who call on your name, that the old life is gone, the new has come. So help us to live in that confidence, to say this new life has come and we want to love you and live for you and be your children. Help us not to give in to doubt and fear, but to live in the promise of you. So God, this morning as we worship you, we ask that you would help us to be honest with you. Set us free. We love you and praise you. Amen.